This video is concerned with the result which is very frequently quoted in econometrics textbooks which is, but which is very rarely proved. The result is that when we estimate a model by ordinary least squares uh, with heteroscedastic errors then the variance of the OLS estimator is biased downwards when we have a positive relationship between the variance of the error and the square of the x variable. We will be proving this um, in quite excruciating algebraic detail, so if you're willing to accept the result as it stands, then um, please turn off the video now. But if you're interested in seeing how we arrive at this result, then um, we will be going through this, as I said, in very... This extract is taken from Stuart and Wallace's textbook. Um, here, they state the problem, first of all. Um, and then below the equation, they define the issue that we want to investigate. In particular, the direction of the bias in the OLS estimate of the variance of the OLS estimator depends upon the relationship between the square of the x variable, or its deviation from the mean, and the um, variance of the error term, sigma i squared. If these two quantities are positively related, then Stuart and Wallace state that the calculated variance of beta at 2 will underestimate the true one. This next um, extract is taken from Madala's textbook. Now he goes into a little bit more detail here in that first of all he defines the variance of the OLS estimator and its expected value in the top equation, then he compares that with the true variance and then below that he restates the property we want to investigate that if the variance of the error term and the square of the x variable are positively correlated then we'll get an underestimate of the true variance. And he also provides a more detailed condition for this that the sum of xi squared sigma i squared must be greater than 1 over n multiplied by the sum of xi squared multiplied by the sum of sigma i squared. But it's not clear exactly where this result comes from. OK, so we're going to use Madala's notation for this exercise. So we start off by assuming that all Gauss-Markov assumptions apart from the third assumption are satisfied. So we're just going to allow for heteroscedasticity, but none of the other problems that are associated with regression models. Our regression model takes this form, y equals beta x plus u. The OLS estimator has the familiar form, beta hat equals the sum of x, y divided by the sum of x squared, and if we substitute for y from the original regression model, we can write this in this form here, where we have beta plus the sum of x u divided by the sum of x squared. It immediately follows that OLS is um, unbiased, because if we take the expectation of beta hat, then the expectation of beta hat is equal to beta plus the sum of the x times the expected values of the u's divided by the sum of the x squares, and since the expected value of each of the ui's is equal to zero, it follows that the expected value of beta hat equals the true value beta, and the OLS is unbiased. So basically we don't need the assumption of homoscedasticity to prove unbiasedness. Now, turning to the variance of the OLS estimator, the variance of the OLS estimator is the expected value of beta hat minus its expected value, which we've just shown is equal to the true value beta squared. So that's equal to the expected value of the sum of xi ui divided by the sum of xi squared, all squared. And again, using the properties of the Gauss-Markov assumptions, we can show that taking expectations here gives us the following expression. The variance of beta hat equals the sum of xi squared sigma i squared divided by the sum of xi squared all squared. Note that we are no longer making the assumption that the variance of the errors is constant. So each of these sigmas has got a different i subscript here. Now this is what we're going to refer to as the true variance of the OLS estimator. And what we're going to compare this with is the estimated variance using the standard formula. So if we consider the standard formula for the OLS estimator, this can be written as the following expression. The variance of beta hat equals the residual sum of squares divided by n minus 1, 
So that's the OLS estimator of the residual variance under the assumption of homoscedasticity divided by the sum of xi squared. So that's just a standard formula which you'll already be familiar with. So to compare this with the true, true variance, we need to compute the expectation of this expression. In particular, we need to compute the expected value of the residual sum of squares. OK, so let's now consider the residual sum of squares. We can re write the residual sum of squares in this form here as the sum of y minus beta at x squared. And by um, appropriate substitution, we can in turn write that as the sum of y minus beta xi minus beta hat minus beta xi all squared. The purpose of doing this is so that we can write it in the following form as the sum of ui minus the sum of xi ui divided by the sum of x squared multiplied by xi all squared. So we've got rid of the y's and we've replaced them with u's and this will allow us to calculate the variance. So now expanding that quadratic expression we can write this as the sum of ui squared plus the sum of ui um, xi uh, divided by sum of xi squared all squared xi squared minus 2 times this product here. Okay. And again, this simplifies down in a couple of lines of algebra because when we take the summation through this expression, we can cancel the sum of xi squared here. And then we note that we got plus this expression here and minus 2 times the same expression here, which will leave us with the sum of ui squared minus the sum of xi ui all squared divided by the sum of xi squared. I've gone through that algebra a bit quickly, but basically that we're just trying to get to this end result here where we've got the expression for the residual sum of squares in terms of the squared um, regression errors. Now, taking expectations, the sum of each of these ui squared is the sigma i squared, the variance of the errors. So we can write this as the expected value of the residual sum of squares is the sum of sigma i squared minus the sum of xi squared sigma i squared divided by the sum of xi squared. And again, we're making use of the standard Gauss-Markov properties here because all the cross product errors, the ui, uj's, where um, i is not equal to j, drop out when we take expectations. So it's only the third Gauss-Markov assumption that we're concerned with here. Just as an aside, in the special case where sigma i squared is a constant, say sigma i squared is equal to sigma u squared for all values of i, then this would reduce to a familiar expression. We'd have the expected value of the residual sum of squares is equal to n minus 1 multiplied by the variance of the error term sigma squared u. And that's a standard result um, that we come across very early in our study of statistics. Now, in the general case, we therefore have the OLS variance, the variance of the OLS estimator, can be written as the expected value of the residual sum of squares, which we've just derived here, the sum of sigma i squared minus the sum of xi squared sigma i squared over the sum of xi squared, divided by n minus 1, and divided by the sum of xi squared. Simplifying the expression for the OLS variance, we can write it in this form here. The variance of the OLS estimator is 1 over n minus 1 multiplied by the sum of xi squared multiplied by the sum of sigma i squared minus the sum of xi squared sigma i squared all divided by the sum of xi squared all squared. We can now compare the OLS estimator of the variance with the true variance. And in particular, we want to show the circumstances under which the OLS estimator underestimates the true variance. So we want to find the conditions under which the true variance is greater than the OLS estimator. That's given by this, uh, this condition here. Now straight away, when we write down this condition, we can cancel the sum of xi squared all squared from both sides because this is a non-zero positive number 
so we can get rid of that and simplify the expression straight away. Then we can multiply through by n minus 1 and write it in this form here. n minus 1 multiplied by the sum of xi squared to sigma i squared must be greater than the sum of xi squared multiplied by the sum of sigma i squared minus the sum of xi squared to sigma i squared. But again we can simplify this a little because we can add this term here to both sides and rewrite the condition as n multiplied by the sum of xi squared to sigma i squared must be greater than the sum of xi squared multiplied by the sum of sigma i squared. Now the suggestion from the textbook quotes that we looked at was that if sigma i squared and xi squared are positively correlated then this condition will be satisfied so the OLS estimator will underestimate the true variance. So let's see whether or not this condition holds or not. So let's sigma i squared equal sigma squared u, a constant, multiplied by xi squared. And that means that there'll be a positive correlation between the variance and the square of the x variable. Well, if that's the case, then our condition becomes n sigma squared u multiplied by the sum of xi to the power 4 must be greater then sigma squared u multiplied by the sum of xi squared multiplied by the sum of xi squared. Now we can immediately cancel that constant sigma squared u from both sides of this expression and this will give us an expression which we can use to evaluate whether or not this condition holds. The approach we'll take is that we will consider some special cases here and show that these generalize. The reason I've adopted this approach is that it's very difficult to prove it in the general case but if we take special cases then we'll see that a pattern emerges and it becomes easy to generalize that pattern and prove the general result. Okay, let's take our first of our special cases. Let's take the case n equals 2. This is going to reduce the condition to a very simple relationship. In this case, our condition becomes the following. 2 multiplied by x1 to the power 4 plus x2 to the power 4 must be greater than x1 squared plus x2 squared multiplied by x1 squared plus x2 squared. Now this is true if and only this condition holds. Expanding the, um, both sides, we get 2x1 to the power 4 plus 2x2 to the power 4 must be greater than x1 to the power 4 plus x2 to the power 4 plus the cross product terms x1 squared x2 squared plus x2 squared x1 squared. Taking everything to the left hand side, we can write this as x1 to the power 4 plus x2 to the power 4 minus x1 squared x2 squared minus x2 squared x1 squared must be greater than 0 and this factorizes quite straightforwardly so that we can show this condition holds if and only if x1 squared minus x2 squared all squared is greater than 0. Now the left hand side of this inequality is, this, is a squared quantity so this condition must hold. So we've shown that the condition must hold when n equals 2 but does it hold for more general cases if we increase the number of observations. Let's take n equals 3. If n equals 3 then the condition becomes as follows. We have 3 multiplied by the sum of the xi to the power 4's. It must be greater than the product of the sum of the squares of the xi's um, multiplied by itself. So again, if we expand this, then we uh, can show this condition holds if and only if the following condition holds. So expanding both sides of it here. And then again, doing a little bit of rearranging, subtracting things from the right-hand side. So we bring everything to the left-hand side. We can write it in this form here, where we've got 2, again, multiplied by each of the xi to the power of 4s, minus 2 multiplied by each of the possible cross products x1 and x2, x2, x3 and so on. So if this expression here is greater than 0 again the condition holds. And again we can factorize this. It's a little more difficult than it was when a, n equals 2 but with a little bit of work we can show that this condition holds if and only if 
x1 squared minus x2 squared up squared plus x1 squared minus x3 squared squared plus x2 squared minus x3 squared squared is greater than 0. And again, the left-hand side of this expression consists of the sum of squared quantities and therefore must be positive. So again, um, we've shown that this condition must hold if n equals 3. The question, of course, is whether or not it extends further. But what we can see is that there is a pattern emerging and that we can extend this quite straightforwardly for values of n that are greater than or equal to 4. Using the pattern that we've established, we can relatively straightforwardly show that our condition now becomes the following. The sum from i equals 1 to n minus 1 of the sum from j equals i plus 1 to n of xi squared minus xj squared all squared must be greater than 0. Again, this must be true because all the items on the left hand side of this are squared quantities and as a result this condition must be satisfied. So therefore we've shown that in general the variance of the OLS estimator um, or the standard formula for the variance of the OLS estimator underestimates the true variance when the variance of the error term sigma i squared and the variance of the or the square of the x variable are positively correlated. And this is quite an important result when it comes to interpreting models with heteroscedastic errors because what it suggests is um, that in models like this where we've got this positive relationship between the variance of the error and the square of the x variable which is very common in heteroscedastic models then um, our estimates of the standard errors of the coefficients will be too low and our t-tests that are based on um, these models uh, will tend to reject the null hypothesis too often. Okay, if you've stuck with this video this long then congratulations because this has been a long and somewhat tedious proof and I think you can see why it doesn't appear in most of the textbooks because while the result itself is quite important it's a very lengthy proof and it does take a lot of application to get through it but hopefully in the process of doing so you've seen some of the methods that we can use to prove the sort of results that we need for an understanding of econometric models.